We have an appendix that can burst. You have a pinky toe. When was the last time you made good use of that? Oh, you'd be surprised. <laughs> <laughs> Natural selection is not completely random. And all these stages, one by one, they step by step, they incrementally improve. And every improvement is the new starting place for the variations at that generation. And they come about not through any design process, not through any deliberate design. Natural selection is the blind watchmaker. This is Star Talk. Neil deGrasse Tyson here, your personal astrophysicist. And today, I'm in conversation with the one, the only, <laughs> Richard Dawkins. Richard, welcome back to my office. Thank you very much. This is like your fourth time here or something. I've I lost count. Something like something that. Something like always, that. Always a pleasure, Neil. <laughs> oh, welcome. I mean, we, we have a lot of catching up to do, I think. Um, so recently, or at least this year, we lost Daniel Dennett, philosopher yes. Daniel Dennett. I recently learned, I didn't read all of his books, I read some of them. Uh, he declared that Darwin's evolution by natural selection was the greatest idea anybody ever had. He's coming to it not as a biologist, but as a philosopher. So how do you reflect on that declaration? He said that at the beginning of his book, uh, Darwin's Dangerous Idea, and his point was that uh, before Darwin came along, it seemed obvious to everyone that big complicated things like humans and oak trees and things had to have a, an, an explanation in terms of design. And it was a huge stroke of insight for Darwin to see that it didn't, that the laws of physics alone could produce this prodigious amount of complexity filtered through this odd process of natural selection. To me, it's always been strange that it took so long, that it took until the middle of the 19th century for Darwin and Wallace, and even maybe one or two other people. This is thousands of years of thought. Of, yes, and, and brilliant when, people have come before. Aristotle could have, could have had it and didn't. I mean, when you think how much cleverer you had to be to do what Newton did, uh, or, or Leibniz, um, inventing calculus, um, working out about the laws of how, how, how gravity... The, the <laughs> Newton finger puppet here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. um, you'd think that somebody would have t tumbled to evolution by natural selection before the middle of the 19th century, yet they didn't. And so that's an astonishing thing, and it needs an explanation. Did Daniel Dennett explain why it took that long? Or, and if he didn't, what would be your explanation? I don't remember whether he did. Um, well, first of all, Ernst Meyer, the great, I mean, he was here, I think. Here at the American Museum of Natural yeah. History. Uh, he thought it was because of essentialism. He thought that, that because of Aristotle and Plato, who thought that just because they thought like geometers, I mean, a, a, a right angle triangle is a kind of perfect form sort of hanging out there. And they thought that the perfect rabbit, the perfect rhinoceros was hanging out there just, just like a right angle triangle. So you couldn't imagine how a rabbit could turn into anything different. That, that was his explanation. That wouldn't be mine. I mean, I, th I, think, I think it's just that... Uh, that's an interesting one, though, because it is. speaks to the bias that we have observing nature. I mean, even in my field. So my people, including Copernicus, could not shake the idea of orbits that were perf perfect circles. They couldn't shake that. Why would God design a universe with a shape that wasn't geometrically perfect? So even Copernicus putting the sun back in the middle of the known universe had circular orbits. And since the orbits are not circles, they actually differed from predictions on the night sky. So that was a problem at the time. It's like Copernicus, this might work, but it still doesn't fit. The epicycles are doing much better. And so, so it wasn't instantly taken up, it's including the resistance the church resistance, of course, because yes, Earth, Earth yes. wasn't in the middle yeah. anymore. Our counterpart to what I think you're describing is the urge to try to presume nature was perfect and then account for it with everything we know that is. Going back to uh, why it took so long and the idea of the perfect rabbit, the perfect rhinoceros, the perfect horse, um, in a way that's a bit silly because if you want to look at, I mean, a population of rabbits is, is pretty variable and... Um, Anyway, that, that was Ernst Meyer's explanation for why it took so long. Um, Darwin did it by going via artificial selection. 
Um, everybody knew, farmers knew, horticulturalists knew, gardeners knew. You could change a rose, you could change a cabbage uh, by just breeding. And really Darwin's insight was to say you don't actually need a breeder. You don't need, need a human to do the breeding. Nature does it for you. Survival does it for you. It's not that difficult. I mean, it doesn't require any sort of higher mathematics or anything. And yet so, nobody got it until Darwin and Wallace. And this is why I'm intrigued that Daniel Dennett, a philosopher who, in principle, any philosopher could have come up with this, because unlike relativity and unlike quantum physics, which are realms of behavior of the universe, large and small, that you can't just deduce from your armchair. But evolution by natural selection could have been deduced in an armchair. Yeah, it I just wasn't. It could. It, 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 it's surprising that it did, didn't. Um, it's interesting that both Darwin and Wallace were traveling naturalists, and they both were collectors uh, in South America, both were in South America. Wallace lost his entire South American collection in a fire. Um, and then he went to the Far East, but, but they were both collectors of natural history specimens. And um, the other person who might have thought of it is Patrick Matthew, who, who was a gardener and an orchard keeper. Um, but philosophers, no, they didn't do it. They didn't, and they could have. They could have, yes. So you've written, I mean, I have a list here of like all your books. You've been out of control over <laughs> Not as much as some people. <laughs> <laughs> was The Selfish Gene your first book? Yes. Back in 1976? Yes. Um, I was, that was the year I graduated high school. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, I remember because it was like the bicentennial year. Everybody made a big deal of this. It was my first presidential election that I could vote in. And I voted for Jimmy Carter. And I got to Good tell him this so cliched line. But I, when I met him, I said, you were my first president that I voted for. And it was one month after my birthday, I got to vote for him. Uh, so I thought I'd have a short exercise here. I'm gonna mention your books. Could you just tell me what your favorite bit of that book was that you were communicating with the reader, if I may? So start off, The Selfish Gene. Natural selection chooses between genes. Genes are the only thing, the information contained in genes. Digital information is the only thing that goes from generation to generation. That which survives is information, digital information. Some genes survive better than others. We, the bodies, we, the animals, we, the plants, are just the machines that are there to preserve the genes that ride, in, that, that ride inside us. Whoa. Okay. So... <laughs> That reminds me of how I describe your gut bacteria. I, I say oh, yes. people want to think they're like top of the world. And I say, all you are to those bacteria is a darkened vessel of anaerobic fecal matter. <laughs> That's right. And, and it's pretty much the same with your, with your genes. I mean, it's not, it's not fecal matter. It's <laughs> testicular matter or ovarian matter. But, but yes. Okay. So they're the ones and they're the ones carrying themselves forward. Yes. So if it's just information, can you imagine a day where the biology is no longer necessary and you just have the digital information stored or, or duplicated in some way? Yes, certainly. Uh, you could, I mean, already you could preserve your entire genome. Um, I mean, I've got my entire genome on, on one disc. Uh, and I, I once... Do you have a backup? <laughs> <laughs> just checking. Um, is it on the cloud? Is it... The, uh -huh. the idea was... I don't have a backup. The idea was it was a television program, and the conceit of the program was it was going to be posted into the family vault, the Dawkins family vault in the church at Chipping Norton. Oh my God! To be dug up in a thousand years. Uh huh. And they were and like a, like a time capsule. Yeah, yes. exactly. And the idea was that in a thousand years they dig it up and make a duplicate of me. And of course, then we talk about why it wouldn't actually be me because it would just be an identical twin of me. Mm -hmm. um, but that that was the idea. Was it you? Yes, it must have been you, because who else would do this? <laughs> Post it on social media. It was, no, if you had a, a book of the, a picture of your mother. I think you're thinking of... Of your mother's mother. Yeah, you, you, you pile them up. It's just one, one of many ways of, of dramatizing the, the, the enormity of, of geological time. I forget exactly how it goes. There are lots mm -hmm. of ways of doing it. I mean, no, but you do this, and if you keep doing it, one of those pictures is... Is a fish. Is a fish. <laughs> <laughs> and yet, and yet, every single generation looks like the the, the previous one and and the next one. There's no sudden. There's no sudden. It's not sudden. And many people can't grasp this. They think, well, there must have been a time when it 
stop being a fish and, you know, must but there wasn't. It just gradually, 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 gradually changed. Okay, will you allow me, given this, which I completely understand, you have to allow me my explanation for the chicken and the egg. Okay. Okay, so I tell people, but I've never gotten your blessings on this. Can I use that word with you? <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. I'm all for blessings. <laughs> so, so I simply tell people, they say, what came first, chicken or the egg? I said, the egg. It was just laid by a bird that was not a chicken. Yes. That's a fair statement. It was laid I mean, by a I'm, com I'm compressing yes. a billion, you know, a hundred million years of time there. Yes. But at some point you're going to say what comes out of the egg is a chicken. And, but that's a, that's a genetic um, alteration from the previous generation. But there never was a moment when a bird that was not a chicken gave rise to a chicken. It, was, it never was. Of course. It, it so this is a, a very compressed, yes. uh, it's a shorthand yes. for what you just said with yes. the book of your ancestors, yes. going back to the fish. Yes. I, I mean, I, I once had a letter from a, lo a lawyer who said, um, roughly speaking, you, evolution can't be true because, it's, because a, a species is defined as members can always interbreed with each other. And you can't imagine that there was a time when child generation was incapable of breeding with the previous generation. Of course you couldn't. But he thought that meant that some evolution was invalid. He couldn't grasp that. everything fact. was specially created. Uh, yeah. yeah. Ev everything is, it, it's a gradual process all the way through. And, and, and as you step back through your ancestors, they become slightly less like a human, slightly less like a human, but you never notice it as, as you walk past them. If you imagine- I want to see a fish. <laughs> it's just funny. So you skip ahead and there's a fish. You say, that's my parent. Yes. That's, yes. It's a little freaky but, for but, people. But, but you, gotta, you, you gotta appreciate- as you, as you walk along the generations, you'd never see, you'd never see them, them getting more fish-like. It would just be so, so gradual, you'd never notice it. Because generations are only 30, 40 years, yes. and we're talking billions. Yes, that's right. You needed deep time for evolution to do what it needed to do. Even in the 19th century, my people, the most we were going to give you as a biologist or even the geologist was 10 million years, 20 million at tops. We didn't know about energy contained inside the nucleus of the atom yet. Nuclear energy, which is how the sun makes fuel. We didn't know that at the time. So the best we could do was say it was a lump of coal. Darwin's son, George, George. Charles Darwin's son, George, is one of the people who pointed out eventually that nuclear energy um, could do the trick. Oh. A nice little person. Okay, <laughs> thank, thank, thank him for him. Yeah. <laughs> Which of the Darwins explained tides for the first time? Probably George, I, okay. I'm not sure. A, it was a Darwin. Yes. And Newton and Galileo did not understand tides. It was, even though they had all the gravity necessary Is that right? to account for yes. it. Yes. It there's a subtle point with tides where if you look at any textbook, any textbook, It'll have like the moon and earth and it'll have a tidal bulge pointing towards the moon. Yes, that's wrong. It's wrong. Yes. It doesn't, it, the moon would want that to happen, yes. but that's not how it is. Yes. The tidal bulge is in advance of the moon in its orbit. Yes. Okay. And that's earth's rotation pushing the tides ahead of the moon. And it's that interaction that has remarkable consequences. The moon is slowing down earth's rotation. And Earth already slowed down the moon's rotation, so it's tidally locked to us. We'll one day be tidally locked. We'll be double tidally locked. And when that happens, then the tides will line up because we're not be pushing it ahead of the moon. So that had to, somebody had to figure all that out. Yes. So that was another Darwin. Thank, thank you for your Darwins. <laughs> <laughs> New developments and discoveries are happening every single day. So keeping up with science and the world can be difficult for anyone. Misinformation spreads online at the speed of light and trusted news outlets report on the same story differently. So, how do we find the truth? As science enthusiasts, we know how important it is to rely on research, data, and putting theories through endless testing before coming to any conclusion. Well, our news consumption shouldn't be any different. And with the help of our partners at Brown News, you can take the same approach and be guaranteed to receive a fully comprehensive and balanced viewpoint on the news and hot topics of the day. Ground News was founded by a former NASA engineer, so you know you can find your favorite topics such as space and science. They gather news-related articles from around the world, add data-driven context, 
and create story overviews like this one, covering new primate chromosome maps shedding light on human evolution. With the Vantage Plan, you can easily find research and compare it with media framing, as well as get insights into different perspectives around the globe. You can also switch editions to the UK, Europe, and Canada to get news that's most important to you. That's why we believe in the ground news methodology, because anyone who's done extensive research knows cross-referencing is the only way to verify accuracy. So if you want to be a critical thinker and you desire a data-driven, objective approach to understanding the world, head over to groundnews.com slash startalk to stay fully informed on the latest in space and science. Use the exclusive link for StarTalk fans to save 40% on the Vantage plan for unlimited access to all their features. All right. Let's get back to the show. You came up with the word meme. I know it was you. Yeah, that was in the selfish gene. That was in the selfish gene. Yes, yeah. You invented the word. And people long forgot. Tell me the authentic definition of meme, because that's not how anybody's using it today. A unit of cultural inheritance and the analog of the gene in, in, in cultural inheritance. Okay, so this is, this is communicated from one person to another. Yes. And certain memes have higher communicability. I, mean, I, I really wanted to, to say that because the whole book had been about the gene as the unit of selection, that's how I, descri I described it when you asked me earlier, um, it didn't have to be genes. It could be anything that is self-replicating. And nowadays I would have used a computer virus as, as, as my mm. analogy probably for the gene. Mm -hmm. But in those days, computer viruses, well, maybe they've been invented. I didn't know about them anyway. <laughs> um, so I used the unit of cultural inheritance. It's something like a, um, so a tune. So M, M is for memory. So a memory gene. It's a yes, portmanteau. It's, it's, of... it's, it's, that's right. It, it comes from the same root as, as, as memory. Okay. So if I say something, we have alligators in the New York City subway. Yes. If, if that spreads, if that, if that spreads because it's a, a repeatable lie, or, or, or even it might be true, whatever it is, if, if it spreads. <laughs> whatever it is, doesn't matter what it doesn't is. Doesn't matter. If it spreads, then it's a successful meme. Because it's so interesting to me, I yes. have to tell someone else. Exactly. Exactly. We love to tell stories which surprise whether or not people they're or true. amuse people, whether or not they're true. <laughs> so nowadays, it's just an image of something kind of cool, you know. Yes, I'm rather sorry about that. Yeah. No, no I'm not, that's not your fault. No. But it, it's, you've contributed to our culture. So the best of the memes are the ones that are spread around the most. That yes. There's yes. a meme of me doing this. Okay. Yes. Like, I think, what is it called? Uh, watch out. You got a badass over here. I never said that. Okay. And there is a picture of me doing this. Uh, but, but it spreads. It, it spread. And there are people in South America who saw me in the street. There were, there were tourists. I said, oh, we know you from the meme. This is like. 10 years ago or something. I think that the meme really, that's not even me. I, why did they? So somehow that spread. I don't have any understanding of it. Should but, I tell you my John Cleese story about that? He was. What is that? What, you, you, do, you, do you remember um, Faulty Towers? And, and Yes. Yes. Okay. Well, there's, there's an episode where, the, where some Germans visit, visit the hotel and, and um, Basil Faulty is going, don't mention the war. Don't, don't mention the war. And of course he does, does mention it. Anyway, he was in, I think it was Munich Airport, and he was going up the escalator, and there was a man way over there and going down the escalator, right, right across the hall. And, and he recognized him, and he shouted, don't mention the wall! <laughs> okay. So that meme was spreading in Germany. So that's a selfish gene. So let's move ahead.